Hi, it's Beck Castro, back for chapter 15 of my book, Floweranta. As I said in some of the previous chapters, BB, Cece, and I were at a special location uh, to film chapter 15. Uh, we went to a park near our house. There was a nice river flowing behind us. There were trees all around us. It was very nice, except I didn't frame the camera right, so you have about this much of my head cut off for most of it. So I wanted to put a cleaner introduction in here. Despite the weird camera framing, I hope you still enjoy chapter 15. Here we go. The castle was mostly abandoned when they passed through its gates again. In the courtyard, someone had broken the head off the Shrew Tonight statue, and the fountain trickled water into the basin. The Monster Knight and Landwalker guards on the premises were nowhere to be seen. The few remaining russet workers that hadn't evacuated the moment they heard Scorso was dead wandered around with slumped shoulders and blank faces like they were lost. The fountain they were seeking was magically back to its original location. The water in the fountain had recovered from being stifled by sand in the castle. Water bubbled out of the top and splashed down into the pool that had already collected in the basin. The sounds of the gurgling water comforted them and the four stood in reverent silence for a few moments. Bushrell held out his elbow to Malin, and she wrapped her arm around it. Beverly stood still and kept her eyes trained on the ground until Mash hobbled over to her and swung his arm around her shoulder. You never told us what happened after Tumsky locked us in the punishment room, said Mash. Oh my gosh, we were so scared, said Beverly. The door just disappeared and we didn't know what to do. We ran back to the dining room to try to find help, and Mei Lin saw two people she recognized. Yeah, those guys you were filling fountains with, Mash. They were walking to, into the dining room at the same time we were. Beverly bobbed her head. We told them everything, even though we didn't know if it was the right thing to do. I wanted to find Nautica because I remembered she could read your minds. The younger guy, Lantano, right? Asked Mei Lin. Lonnie, yeah, said Mash. Lonnie said he'd help us find Nautica. She was waiting for us at the river's edge, and she told us you were trapped somewhere in the mountain. But she knew the army was going to attack the next day, so she asked Lonnie if Beverly and I could stay with his family for the night. Beverly interrupted. Then some guy ran into the room where we were all sleeping and yelled something about a battle going on in the mountain. Everyone was really worried and started freaking out. Malin sighed. That's when we knew it was time to go. Lonnie showed us the way until we found Olivia, and you know the rest. Wow, I should let Nautica know I'm safe after this, said Mash. Bushrell pulled Malin's arm a little closer under his elbow. That was smart of you to go find Nautica. With all this fighting, I bet you can't wait to go home, said Mash. Beverly clutched Mash's waist. It was the scariest. Even after all that, I kind of don't want to go. Don't say that, said Mash. I would go if I could. I'll figure out how to get there someday. And then I'll come find you girls. He squeezed Beverly's shoulder. You. His hand found the back of her neck under her curtain of hair as he pulled her toward him, wrapping his other arm around her back. He felt her hand press into his back, too. He held on tight, wishing there was a way for him to go with her. Bushroll and Malin faced each other with the back of Malin's legs leaning on the fountain. They just stared for moments, memorizing each other's faces. Are you sure you would not want to stay? asked Bushroll. I can't, but if I can come back and visit, I will, all the time, said Malin. Bushrell squeezed both her hands. They embraced and separated to say goodbye to their other traveling companions. Bushrell and Beverly shared a quick, affectionate hug, and Beverly waved a little before she sat on the edge of the fountain and waited for Malin. I wasn't sure about you at first, but you really are a good guy. I hope you do make it to our land someday. Thank you, Malin. That, me that means a lot. Mash gave her a big bear hug, taking her off the ground so that she let out a little squeak. Beverly waded into the water, and Bushrell was quick to offer a hand to help both of the girls in. Once they were standing up to their knees in running water, Beverly asked, Hey Bushrell, do you think your mom wants these back? She held up the side of her now dingy, flowery dress. No, no, you keep those. Take care, Maylin and Beverly. Hurry back if you can. We will, they said. The girls waved as they stepped backwards to let the water from the highest tier spill over their heads. And then they were gone. Mash leaned his elbow on Bushrell's shoulder and the boys waved back. Bushrell let Mash use his shoulder as a crutch while they walked back to the lake to meet Nautica. 
They walked in contemplative, in contemplative, they walked in contemplative silence through the castle. It wasn't until they passed through the doors of the courtyard that Mash spoke. I give you a lot of credit, Bushrol. Grassy, why? I don't know how anyone could be a soldier. To see that much pain and death, and then to know you probably caused some of that pain and death? Mash shook his head. I couldn't do it. Bushrol pondered that for a moment. You know, I originally only wanted to be a soldier because my father was one. I wanted to be as accomplished a bowman as he was. But it is more than that now. I like protecting people, and I like training people. You, Beverly, and Maylin helped me learn that. If I have to fight sometimes to protect the freedom of my family and friends, I will do it willingly. And then someday, after I am no longer a recruit myself, I can train new recruits. You would be good at that, as much as I hate to admit it. If I can train you, I can train anyone. Mash didn't argue. I was pretty hopeless, wasn't I? Bushrol just laughed through his nose in response. What are your plans? You mean besides getting out of here as soon as I can? Yes, besides that. Mash rolled his shoulders and adjusted his grip on Bushrol's. I think I'll take up the family business too. I like talking to people and keeping a journal. It's the best fit for me while I'm still here. Bushrol nodded. Only Nautica's forehead and vibrant blue orbs peeked above the water as the boys approached. What were you doing? asked Mash. Her pale green finger appeared above the surface to point behind them. In the distance, a monster knight circled one of the mountains before disappearing behind it. When she was sure it was safe, she propelled her entire torso out of the water with a push of her tail, grabbed Mash and Bushrol by the waists of their shorts, and pulled them into the lake with two big splashes. Mash sputtered and flailed while he treaded water with his good leg. Do not ever get yourself captured like that again! She embraced them both around the neck, in more of a headlock than a hug. I was so worried. Chill out, Nautica, said Mash. Yes, please. I have already been choked once today, said Bushrol. She released them. Sorry. Bushrol felt his neck where it was still red from the king's hold. It is all right. Thank you for your concern. He paddled to the shore. I should get home to my mother. Will you visit me? She batted her eyes at Bushrol. He bowed his head, as often as I can. Nautica's green cheeks turned pink. Bushrol offered Mash a hand as Mash crawled onto the shore. Then they faced each other, put a hand over their hearts, and nodded. Let me know when your next quest is. I will write all about it, said Mash. Bushrol smiled. I shall. He stomped off toward the tree line. The pace was slow with Mash limping along next to the water. He located a large stick lying on the ground that looked like the one he had used the day he met Bushrol. With the stick helping him walk, he was able to keep up a little better. Nautica seemed pleased with the slow progression after having to rush back and forth the past couple of days. It almost felt like a normal day with Nautica and Mash taking a walk together and making fun of each other. Except everything had changed. They had seen death and torture and hunger. And Nautica no longer felt the need to flirt with Mash. Instead of the wistful glances directed at him, they were now directed far off into the distance, perhaps thinking about Bushrol. But Mash didn't mind. Behind his own wishful glances were thoughts of the other land, even more enthusiastic than ever. After some time, what was left of Mash's house became visible on the horizon. He came to a halt and leaned on his walking stick. What if my parents aren't there? They are. Nautica's eyes watered, but no tears fell. They have been waiting for you. I will come visit you tomorrow. I want to hear all about everything you did while I was locked in that cell. Will you be all right without me for the rest of the day? Nautica scoffed. Yes, I think I will manage, Gimpy. I will see you tomorrow. Mash shot her one of his sideways grins and headed off toward his house in the distance. His mother must have seen him coming because she was running toward him before he was anywhere near the house. Far away, he could see his father standing in front of their tree home. His mother sobbed. Mash quickened his pace and dropped the stick before they reached each other. Then she held him in his arms and patted his head as she cried into his hair. I thought you had gone to the amaranth. You look thinner. And your leg, what happened to your leg? Mash rubbed his mother's back. I promise I wouldn't go. I will tell you and father the whole story if you wish. Me up something to eat and drink. And maybe if I can sleep in your bed tonight. Of course, son, whatever you want. She squeezed his shoulders the whole way back to their house. His father, with his angular features, 
which, ma which Mash resembled a little more now, smiled the same crooked smile. You're a hero, son. He gave Mash a big bear hug. I wish I could have been there with you. No, you don't, trust me. But I wish you were there too, Dad. They went inside and Mash opted to lie in his parents' bed while devouring every kind of food his parents could wish up, while he recounted the whole entire story to them. That's the end of chapter 15. Thanks for sticking with me. Hope it sounded okay. Stick around for chapter 16 to see how Mash's story ends. Bye!